The scripture lesson this morning is from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were, with, were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thomas, called Didymus, gets a bum rap in Scripture. I mean, how would you like to be remembered forever as the one who doubted? And yet, I dare say that every one of us in this room have probably at one point or another doubted something in our lives. Isn't that true? Especially the Browns. I mean, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Randy, I couldn't help but say that. <laughs> Thomas is an interesting character. <clears throat> he is seen in only three appearances in all of Scripture, all of which come in the Gospel of John. <clears throat> His name means twin, so it is highly likely that he was a twin. He may have had a brother or a sister and yet, the Bible gives us no indication of anyone else in his life, no other family member, nothing of the sort. Now, Thomas first appears in John chapter 11. It's on the occasion when Lazarus has died. Lazarus, as you know, was a dear friend to Jesus along with Mary and Martha. And Jesus wanted to return to Bethany to comfort Mary and Martha in the loss of their brother and his dear friend. The problem is, Bethany had become, over the course of time, what we would call hostile territory. Jesus left that region because it was becoming increasingly possible that he might lose his life. And so they had gone some distance from Bethany when the news came of Lazarus' death, and Jesus determined that he was going back. That's when we see Thomas for the first time. Thomas is just Thomas. He tells it like he sees it. And to put it in a paraphrased edition, Thomas looks at Jesus and said, well, let's just all go back and die. Jesus, what in the world are you thinking? And yet, if you've read the rest of the story, you know that Jesus and his disciples, along with Lazarus, 
who was raised from the dead would live to see another day. The second appearance of Thomas comes the night before Jesus is crucified. Now John records a rather lengthy farewell address of our Lord before his disciples. And in that address, at one point in John 14, 3 through 4, Jesus says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Then Jesus said this, And you know the way to the place where I am going. That's when Thomas speaks up again. Very courageously, very honestly, he just looks at the Lord and he says, Lord, We do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? I like Thomas because in response, Jesus gives us some of the most remarkable words ever recorded in Scripture. Rather than Jesus giving Thomas a road map or directions on how to get to where he was going, Jesus responded by saying, I am the way and the truth and the life. In other words, Jesus said, Thomas, I'll not give you just directions on how to get there. I'm going to take you there myself. I remember one time back in the old days, before GPS. Does anyone remember days before GPS? <laughs> anyone? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Some of you don't. That's okay. <laughs> that means you're younger than I am. But I remember back in the old days, we carried with us road maps and road atlases and things like that. And I remember on one particular occasion getting so lost and so confused, I probably said some things that preachers shouldn't say. (laughs) I finally pulled into a gas station, and there was a gentleman there pumping gas, and I walked up to him, and I said, Sir, do you know how to get from here to (laughs) I-95. He said, well, sure, I'm going that way. Uh, As soon as I finish here, why don't you just follow me? And I thought, wow, this is a great guy. (laughs) He literally led me to the interstate where, once again, I was found. (laughs) I knew my way. (laughs) And I thank God for that. He could have given me directions. And I would have gotten lost again because you had to go down like three stoplights, make a left, and then three more, and make a right, and then six more, and make... I mean, it was a mess. But he watched me all the way and made sure that I stayed with him. And when we got to the interstate, he waved his hand and went on. You see, that's exactly what Jesus does for us, isn't it? Jesus doesn't just give us a road map to this life and say, here, you're on your own. Just figure it out the best way you can. No. He says, I'll be with you every step of the way. I'll help you. I'll guide you. I'll lead you. You need not fear. I'll never let you down. And so we see Thomas in one final scene where he questions the very validity of the resurrection itself. It seems that on that first occasion when Jesus appeared to his disciples, Thomas was not present with them. 
And after the other disciples saw the Lord and Thomas arrived, they said, we have seen the Lord. And Thomas looked at the other disciples and said, you know, unless I see for myself, unless I can touch his hands and his side, it's going to be awful hard for me to believe. You see, Jesus was having problem. I mean, Thomas was having problems wrapping his mind around this concept of the resurrection at that point. And yet, he would get his answer a week later when Jesus appears a second time. This time, when Jesus enters the room and says, Peace be with you, he looks right at Thomas, already knowing in his heart that Thomas was struggling. And he said, Thomas, come here. See these hands? Touch them. Go ahead. It's all right. Reach out your hand and touch my side where I was pierced. And when Thomas does that, he believes. Then Jesus says something else. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. One thing stands out clearly to me about Thomas, and that is that he gives us permission to question even matters of deep faith. It's by questioning that we gain answers. Even doubting can bear fruit, especially when in the process we see the love of God. When in the process we learn and come to grips with something we previously could not understand. It's often by questioning that we learn and it's through learning that we grow to maturity, is it not? That's why I always say in any Bible study class I ever teach, there are no wrong questions to be asked here. You can ask whatever you want. And even if it seems like, well, that might be a little immature of me to ask such a question when all these other Bible scholars are sitting around me, believe me, some of them are think thinking the same thing. They need to hear an answer to that same question. The questioning of Thomas even even though he doubted it, it doesn't mean that he didn't have faith. It doesn't mean that at all. To the contrary, it was his questioning, it was his asking those questions, and even doubting, that gave him the confidence he would one day need as he went off into ministry on his own, preaching all across Asia, some scholars believe he even preached in China. And certainly we know without doubt that he preached across India where he led many people to Christ. Does that sound like someone who doubted? Because you see in the course of time he gained great confidence in his faith because he was willing to ask the right questions at the right time. Asking questions, even doubting to some degree, doesn't mean we don't have faith in God. Because you see, God wants us to learn and grow. God wants us to come to a place where we are confident in what we believe that we can stand up with assurance and say, yes, this is truly what I believe. And I believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Amen? Amen. It's what we believe. Now, like 
so many of you. I've never had the privilege of seeing the nail prints in his hands or touching his side. And yet, I see Jesus everywhere I go. Every time I wake up in the morning and have another day to live on this earth, I see Jesus. Amen? Every time I see a newborn baby, I see Jesus. Every time I see a person of any age receive Christ into their heart, I see Jesus. Every time I witness a healing, or every time hearts are inspired, I see Jesus. Thomas will likely always be remembered as the one who doubted. He can't get away from that. And yet it was Thomas who gave us one of the greatest confessions of faith ever penned. Because when he touched the hands of Jesus, when he touched his side, before our very Lord, he said, My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Blessed are all of us who have not seen, yet we believe. Amen.